So I have to talk into this mic. So if I start moving away from this mic, like make me stop. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Alexis. I was the one that a lot of you emailed to RSVP um, and the email that you got about. I'm a BFA photography major here on campus um, and I actually specialize in documentary and travel work. Um, and I am the Kennedy Center photo editor. So the photo competition um, is my baby. <laughs> it's what I take care of. Um, the prints and everything that are up in the hall, that's what I do. So I wanted to help you guys have better, like make better pictures while you were abroad. So that's why we're having this workshop and I'm really glad that you're all here. Um, so we're gonna start with some basic stuff. So the Kennedy Center photo competition. So this is kind of what I want to encourage all of you to apply to, right? Um, come September, your, September? I think that's right. Your pictures are due. Um, so we, there anybody that is in this? So fall 2016, winter, spring, or summer 2017. So yeah, in September, you'll just email me three pictures and then they'll go into the running. Um, just so you guys know, they look at this one. I don't want any of this. Okay, so you can color, you can crop. So, oh man, I need to get used to this. Um, you can crop, you can do a little bit of color and contrast adjustments to bring things up, but no major editing, okay? And then black and white pictures are okay. The best thing is, the best in show gets $1,000, okay? Awesome. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you guys have been by and walked through that hallway, but the best in show also is huge up there. It's the biggest one, and it stays up there for a whole year. So that's pretty cool. The one right now that we have up there is a train in Moscow. Um, Parker Wilson took it, and he's, he did great. Um, yeah, and then you get your pictures displayed. So I want to encourage all of you to apply to this. And we're going to talk a little bit about some basic photo stuff. Um, how many of you are taking like a DSLR? Okay, a couple of you. Do you know how to use it in manual mode? Some of you are nodding at me. Some of you are going like this. Okay. <laughs> so a little bit about kind of what's happening in your camera. So with, this is called your aperture and we're gonna go over these. But depending on how open your lens is, depends on how blurry your background is gonna get. And I can't tell you how many times people are like, oh, you're a photographer. Can you make my background blurry? And I go, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's like one of the first things you learn. So if you're trying to take portraits of people, I'm gonna tell you to stay at about a F4, okay? That's gonna blur your background, but you're still gonna get enough of a general sense of it, okay? And how many of you have looked at water pictures and been like, why do mine look terrible and I can't get it to look smooth and pretty? I have done that, I looked it up on YouTube, okay? This is gonna be your shutter speed. So this is right here. The slower your shutter is, the more it's gonna smooth out and the more it's gonna be blurry. So nature shots are great like this. If you're out shooting waterfalls, I don't know where all of you are going, but <laughs> if you're out shooting waterfalls, this is great. You will have, a, you will find a tripod or find a rock, okay? Because you shouldn't shoot handheld lower than 1 60th. Okay, so just so you know. Now how many of you are going places with like cathedrals or old churches or places where you might be shooting inside? Several of you, okay. This is something that you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. This is your ISO, and we're actually gonna go over what all of these are in just a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. So if you, the lowest your camera will probably shoot is ISO 100. That's what I would recommend normally staying on until you're in a church. Then I would bump it up to about 800 or 1600. What's gonna happen is you're gonna get a little bit of grain, but it will actually help it so that otherwise, you're gonna be standing there trying to shoot down here, <laughs> down at 1 4th or 1 8th, and it's gonna be blurry because you're trying to handhold it. So try bumping up your ISO. And you'd be amazed at how many cameras actually have these features um, and you just don't realize it. So like even little point and shoots can help, can be adjusted to do these things. And we're gonna go over some camera types later and what I actually suggest there's, if you haven't bought a camera yet, there's one that I would highly recommend. So we'll talk about that. Anyway, this is kind of an overview of, of aperture. So like I said, if your lens is wide or open, you're gonna get a blurrier background and if it's closed down, you're gonna get everything in focus. And it's kind of hard to remember all of these things. I know, we're gonna go <laughs> kind of quick. And the, the clock is not working. Good, okay. <laughs> um, shutter speed, like I said, if you wanna freeze motion, so if, say you're at like a, I lived in Ukraine and we always went to hockey and soccer games. Um, you wanna get players not blurry, right? You wanna get them like in action. You're gonna want a really fast shutter speed, right? You're gonna want something that's one, 125th. You're gonna want it really high. 
Also, flash will help you freeze things, okay? So if you're, if you're looking at your camera and you're like, I can't choose my shutter speed, try using a flash. Even if it's daytime, it'll help out. Um, okay, ISO sounds complicated, it's not. Like I said, if you're indoors, bump your ISO up to like 800, 1600, that's gonna be an okay where you're not gonna get too grainy. So try to stay around 100 or 200 if you're like outside or in shade or those kinds of things, okay? Awesome. Any questions? I know that was like the quickest blow by of aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. <laughs> Any questions on that? Okay. So a little bit of rules of design. So we're gonna show you some examples, but these are some basic ones that are good to look for when you're looking on how to compose a picture, okay? So you want balance. So are there like repeating shapes? Are the colors harmonious? Kind of what's going on? Um, and try, Something that I think people don't know a lot about is this value. And if you're going, why is everything like the same tone? It's probably not the same tone, it's probably the same value. And that means that light is hitting everything in your picture the same. So move, I'm like, shouldn't move from this mic, I know. Um, <laughs> move and try and get to a place where there's a little bit more contrast or um, a little bit more variance in your light and that will help kind of bring things up a little bit. Repetition. Um, we're going to talk about leading lines. Anything that is kind of symmetrical and looks similar or even not symmetrical, right? Like that's great because you can have some juxtaposition. So if you've got like a crazy slanting building and some great trees, that's going to be cool. Um, contrast, that goes with value, the light and the dark. So if you've got really cool shadows creating shapes, um, if you've got, I'm trying to think of like other examples. Um, if your person is like further in front and you can stop down that aperture a little bit and then you get the blurry background, that's going to create some contrast with your light and dark. Um, yeah. <laughs> Dominance, that's like putting like the cathedral and then like all of the other stuff that's there, right? Or like I um, was just in Bolivia for a month doing a, a documentary project. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Um, and in the churches, there's always like a huge... Christ statue, right? And so if you can like focus on that and make that the dominant thing in the church, that's going to be cool. Um, unity, don't worry about this as much. It's using texture and color. So if you've got like, like I was saying, a jungle with a concrete structure, something like that, that will come together, it actually creates a lot of good texture in your picture and makes people like, hmm, what is that? And then harmony. So this is actually something that I, in my own personal work, see a lot of. It's um, and it's just the way that I shoot. And so you might find yourself like leaning towards like dominance of like one thing being important, or you might lean towards harmony where everything is a little bit more together and makes the picture every, like the more you look at it, the more you see things in it. That's a little bit more harmonious, just depending on your style though. So which one of these is best? You can point, I don't know how you tell me which one is best. This one? Okay, why? Okay. Thirds and a focal point, good. And the horizon line's not in the middle like this one, right? That's the third line, and this is a third. And this one, why doesn't this one work? Because it's also thirds. This is called tension right here. And we want to avoid tension because it messes up your harmony and it makes people feel stressed unless you do that on purpose. You can get painters like J.M.W. Turner, right? He does this perfectly. But this is what I want you guys to strive for, okay? <laughs> so some composition, we just talked about the rule of thirds, right? We're just gonna go through these, okay. Rule of thirds, this is when you're gonna divide your photograph into these nine squares, okay? And you're gonna wanna put, these are called your PowerPoints. Stick with your PowerPoints. It's always a good go-to. <laughs> you got this one, this one, this one, this one. I usually will tell people, try and put people's eyes in the top one. But if you've got important objects, try and put them in the bottom one. Give yourself some space. Give yourself some lines. Do not put your horizon right in the middle. Everyone that attends this workshop, promise me right now, no horizons in the middle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can put it here. You can put it here. Either one is great. But I don't want to see any middle pictures. Okay, this is framing. This is Budapest. I love Budapest. And is anybody going there? No, dang it. <laughs> okay, it's awesome. This is from the Fisherman's Basilica looking out at the state building. Um, this, so this actually does a lot of really good things in this picture, okay? So look, we've got 
divided, right? The horizon line is right in the middle, which, okay, if you do a cool picture like this and it's framed right, I'll let you put the horizon line in the middle, okay? <laughs> um, but it also talks about this um, rule of odds, which is something we'll also talk about. You have one, two, three, and then you have right in the middle the biggest pinnacle and a cool sunset. Also, try not to get bald skies. I know you can do it. Take it as a challenge, okay? Because if this was completely white back here, would it be as cool? No, those clouds like totally make it. So try to avoid bald skies, which is completely white skies. I should say that. All right, leading lines. Anybody going to Paris? Okay, awesome. Take cool pictures of the Eiffel Tower, right? Not everyone's pictures of the Eiffel Tower. So why is this one cool? The lights, yep. Yep, color contrast. That sky, look at that sky. Awesome, yeah, in the back. Exactly, these leading lines, right? These lines of color, these lines of light, and then this as well, all of these squares, this is that repetition, harmonious repetition that we talked about earlier, okay? Um, so no bald skies, a very iconic thing, right? Everybody knows what the Eiffel Tower is and everyone knows what it looks like, so try and take a cool picture of it. <laughs> um, and this, I'll just tell you guys, the way that they got that is because um, the shutter speed was really long. They opened up and let it sit for probably 30 seconds and shut their aperture down. So really small aperture to not let in a lot of light and really long shutter speed. And it creates movement like this. And it gets that color of sky, okay? So if you wanna bring one of those like dinky little tripods, it might be worth it. Okay, here we go, rule of odds. So you can see one, two, three, one, two, three. And that's a good way to put it. Um, if you've got three friends on the program, just like make them pose for you. <laughs> um, go, go stand over there real quick. Um, you can totally do it and people like having their pictures taken and they put them all over social media and it's cool, right? So rule of thirds, just try and remember like if you see, you know, I'm sure this structure right here has more arches, but it's better if you stay in the rule of three, right? Or rule of five. I shouldn't say rule of three, it's rule of odds. <laughs> okay, negative space. How many of you are going to a place with a ton of statues? Okay. <laughs> I, Ukraine, I like felt like every single one of my statue pictures looked exactly the same because they all looked like this. Because <laughs> um, you're trying, you can't get them from a good perspective usually. But try filling it with a good natural space, like good negative space. And then try and not bald your sky out, right? Look for good clouds. Look for, um, I don't know. You can also look for other structures and things. Yes, comment. So it's the fact that this is the only thing in the picture, and then it has all of this space around it. So if you're taking a picture of a statue, try and isolate it, right? So that you don't have a bunch of wires and buildings and other things in it. Like, just let it be in its space. Um, and yeah, it looks cooler. It looks cleaner. Um, also, this is called dominance, right? That was one of the design principles we talked about was dominance. Like, that's it. That's, that's everything about the picture is that statue. Or you can go the opposite way and totally fill the frame with it. So would this one look probably as cool if you had filled the frame with it? No, because you like what would you zoom in on, right? It'd be like way, way weird angled and things are weird. So some things like architecture are actually better if you fill the frame. Um, anybody going to shoot pictures of like safari animals? <laughs> no? Yes, I see one hand in the back. Okay, cool. Good luck. <laughs> Um, yeah, just fill the frame. That's way cooler than like just a picture of a tiger. Like, or uh, that's a lion. Um, <laughs> just like a picture of the lion's whole mane, right? It's cooler because it's cropped in and it's there and it's right in his face. So if you're shooting architecture as well, step back, look at the whole scene, and then focus on what part of the building you want, like is cool, right? Is that a hand touching your hair? I do that all the time. It's fine. Okay, space. Okay, this comes back to that tension with the sailboat one where it was right at the top and it was like, mm, don't do that. This, look, it's given space to move. This could have been totally like flipped, right? If you flipped it the other way, it's gonna feel more tension because you, you, we read left to right. So the way that you wanna see motion and space is left to right. Um, so if you flip this around and put this boat on this side, it actually will feel like more tension. So just consider that if you look at a picture and you know that you can't 
you know (laughs) that this is on this side and you can't do anything about it, take it and flip it and see which one you like better, okay? Movement. You can't tell. This guy's blurry. Can you guys tell this? Okay. (coughs) So the park is totally in focus on the guy's moving. Is that interesting to you? Why is he moving? What's he doing? Where's he going? So play with it a little bit. People don't have to look at you to be like an interesting photo. (coughs) Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about documentary photography because it's what I do and it's what you guys will be doing. Okay. Um, So this, people confuse documentary photography and journalism. Journalism is like going to a one-time event, documenting it, and bringing it back and and talking about that one event, right? You guys are going to be living in a place, right? Most of you are living in a place for a while. Okay. Um, It's documenting the culture. It's documenting the cool things about it. It's um, getting involved with the people, which I know that a lot of you will be. Even if the people are people in your group, you're going to be getting involved in people's lives. Um, you want truthful, objective, and usually candid photography. Mostly they're people, but they can also be architecture. They can also be, um, gardens. Like I know when I lived in Ukraine, I don't, I know that I talk about that all the time, but I loved it. Um, you, it's one of the cities in Europe that has the most undeveloped land mass, right? So like everything is gardens because they built everything underground. Um, and so we, I have tons of pictures of really cool flower arrangements and all these things because that was part of the culture. Um, so it happens really naturally. Um, you just kind of always stay camera ready. Um, always kind of have your camera right in your bag where it's easy to get to because you're going to miss a lot of moments if you're not like kind of looking. Um, and not that you guys are all photographers and like that's what you want to be doing all the time. But if you're going out to a market and you guys are just going to go look around, don't be afraid to have your camera in hand and get cool moments. Um, and remember to capture details. I think people focus too much on people's faces in documentary photography. They're like, yeah, I'm going to get this portrait with this lady with these eyes and it's going to be so great. Um, remember that also her hands that are knitting could be really cool. Also remember that the little kids playing soccer could be really cool. Like look at the little details um, of, of what's around you. Um, and that's the same thing. Not every photo needs to show their face. I should have brought in my photos. So I just, like I said, went and did this documentary trip in Bolivia for my BFA project. And um, I should have brought this picture and I, dang it, um, I grabbed the wrong hard drive this morning. Um, it's a picture of, they call them cholitas, and it's a person of um, like antiquity, kind of, like they still dress in old fashioned. And so she's sitting there knitting with, but with her hat in the frame. And so her hat takes up most of the frame, but then if you look past it, you can see her knitting. And it's a really cool picture, but you don't see her face, but you actually learn a lot about her. So things like that, just prayer. Um, I don't know where, I wish I knew where everyone was going so we could talk about it a little bit more, but. Um, you know, people saying prayers, people um, doing everyday things, holding hands with their kids, um, pulling strollers, like whatever it is. I loved it. <laughs> um, in Ukraine, they pull their kids on little sleds um, because strollers and things won't work in the snow there. Um, and I love seeing, pic- you know, pictures of little kids on these sleds because they're all bundled up to the nines and can't even move like that kid from the Christmas story. And their moms are like pulling them along and their moms are in stiletto heels. And I'm like, wow, someday I want to be you. Um, and then just remember that this is like your opportunity to create a story and to leave some really cool pictures. So take it seriously. Yeah. Okay. I did want to talk a little bit about privacy because I feel like People don't always know how to ask, and it is kind of hard. I ran into it when I was um, doing my project. It's kind of hard to ask people for permission or, like, know what's violating privacy and, like, what's to in people's faces. Um, Because usually if you're getting a photo of a person, it requires a, um, like, written contract that they sign and that they say, yes, you can use my picture. Um, If you you look down here at the bottom, if you feel inclined, there's actually some... um, apps on your phone that you can draft one really quick and have people sign if they're willing to. Um, but usually I find that if you just ask people, <laughs> um, say, hey, I'm a student doing this project or I'm on this study abroad and I'd love to take your photo, um, people tend to be more open and they go, yeah, okay. And um, So just so you know the law, <laughs> um, if you if someone doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you can take a picture. So like if people are out in the plaza, there's no expectation of privacy to 
getting their picture taken. So you're pretty free to do that. Um, if you walk into someone's home and try and take their picture without permission, that's an invasion of privacy. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Just ask. I think I have a slide about it. Mm, somewhere. Um, so, yeah. If you... Um, no. I know we have one that talks about people. Oh. So environmental portraits are mostly what you'll be taking. Okay. Um, that's what they're called, just so you know the technical name for it. Um, that's just people in their environment. That's what that means. <laughs> so if you have a picture of a potter, like there's a picture of a potter up right now in the hallway. Um, like I was in Chile on the LDS Self-Reliance program, and he asked this guy if he could take his picture and took his picture in his home and in his workshop. And it is, a, I mean, it won in our photo competition. It's really cool. Um, and it's better if you get people in their environments because they're more comfortable, they're more willing to um, not pose as much because if you're in your home, you're like not gonna sit and pose, right? Those are the worst pictures of me, the ones that like my sisters take when I'm sitting at home on the couch because you're not like on guard. When you're in the public and sitting on like a bench, like you're a little bit more posed and stuff. Um, so just remember that if you get to know a family or get to know people, they, in their natural environment, they'll be more honest with you. Um, like this one says, approach with humility, respect, and a light footprint. So always respect people's wishes. Always ask. It's actually better if you can talk to someone before you take their picture and get to know them a little bit and then go, and by the way, would you mind if I took your portrait? Or would you mind if I took your picture? And these, mind you, are for like up close pictures, right? Okay. If you're taking a picture of the square, don't even worry about it because you won't see half the people's faces anyway and it's not a breach of privacy. But if you're getting into that maybe crossing the line of privacy, these are just some good tips. And don't touch your subject, <laughs> okay? Like I said, I don't know the cultures you're going to, but um, here in the States, even when I'm doing a portrait session of someone, I will ask before I move their hair out of their way or um, fix eyebrows or tug shirts down. Um, and in other cultures, just it's better to not touch your subject. You can pose like how you think you would like them to pose, and then they can like mimic you, but just don't touch them. <laughs> um, okay, here's some of these. So these are some tips that I was thinking about asking people. Because honestly, I when I was I did this slideshow before I left for Bolivia thinking I was all prepared, and I came back thinking there's so much more I have to tell these people. Um, so if there's a language barrier, so I spoke Spanish, but I don't speak very much Quechua. Um, in the town that I was working in, they speak mostly Quechua. Potosí? Yeah. Um, so if there is a language barrier, if you point at your camera and are like very friendly and smiley, people will either go, no, 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 or they'll be like, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, and they, they know what you want when they see your camera. If people, if, when people saw me walk up with this and my big lens on it, they like knew immediately, right? That I was like taking pictures of people. Um, and I had people avoid me. <laughs> They like walk the other way or like walk with their like backs like this to me, even though we were like, anyway, it was ridiculous. But um, if they don't want their picture taken, respect their wishes and just move on. Um, I was dying for this picture of a baby in a guayo and I asked probably 15 moms and all of them said no. And I was like so devastated. Um, but just try and keep smiling and remember, like if just say thank you as best you can. Um, is anybody going somewhere where there's going to be a huge language barrier? Yes, a couple. Okay. So, yeah, just, you know, be courteous. You can do it. <laughs> Even if you don't speak their language, you can just, you know, nod and smile and be nice. Um, in some countries, people really like being photographed, and that's great. I hope most of you are going to those countries. Um, the countries that I have lived in are not the case. Ukraine and Bolivia, do they are like, don't look at me. Um, and then... If you want to take someone's picture, do not be timid, okay? Or like you can be timid in your heart, but don't be timid in your face. Go up with a lot of positivity and like be really like excited and animated and like wanting to talk to them and, you know, be kind. Um, and just they'll like, if you're solemn, their pictures will be solemn. But if you're like laughing and like if you speak the language joking with them or um, even if you don't smiling and like being kind and being upbeat, people will radiate that back to you. People will are mirrors when they take pictures because they get so nervous in front of cameras. We do the same thing, okay? If anybody has to go ever get headshots, 
don't stress, okay? <laughs> Just find a good photographer that can be fun and you'll have fun. And I wish I could like show all of you that before you left, but yeah, be the fun photographer. Okay, so I wanted to show you some examples of some good documentary photography. This is really dark because it's on a PowerPoint. How many of you are going to like Asia or Asian countries, anybody? Okay, a couple of you. So really cool, right? Old temples, lots of moss, lots of jungles, really cool things and prayers. But look at this movement, right? With all of these colors, that's, you know, open shutter speed, long shutter speed, everything like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when do you know to use the rule of thirds and not? Yeah, that's a good question. So when to use the rule of, rule of thirds and not? Oh, by the way, we're live streaming, so I have to repeat everything you guys say. So if I sound stupid, just bear with me. Um, okay, so you can see that like these are rules of thirds right here. But the photographer knows that this is dominant, right? This right here is the focal point, and this is the dominant part of the image. And this is what you want to look at, right? That's the, what's in the light. That's what you want focused on, and it, that's a good reason to use motion blur, is if you really want something focused on that will stay still for a little while, everything else will be transitory, right? And then you have that one focus. Um, so that's, you just kind of have to use your gut a little bit. Does anybody watch NCIS? I love that. Use your gut, okay? Follow your gut. And um, yeah, if, if something strikes you, if you're looking at something and it's striking to you, I suggest you take a step back, think about why you, it's really cool, why you like it, why it's, it made you stop, and then create a photo around that. So if you walked in and saw this, like my immediate reaction would be like, that light hitting that man is so cool, right? And you take a step back and think about it, and then you can create your photo around it. Makes sense. Any other questions? Okay, I feel like I'm talking really fast. Am I talking really fast? Yes. Do I show people pictures? Um, especially little kids, yeah. They love to see their own face. <laughs> um, people that older people, unless they specifically ask, I usually don't because they don't like to see their face. They don't. Mm. Why did you do that? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I usually don't show older people because they'll be like, I have wrinkles or I look old or like whatever it is. Um, so unless they specifically ask it, don't. Because then they'll make me delete it. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> um, okay. Why is this image powerful? Yeah, I heard dominance. Right? I don't even know what this is. I think they're traveling. That's like a lot of people in a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? It's so interesting to me because I have no idea what it's about and I have no experience with a culture like that and it's cool, right? Okay, Who's, is anybody going on like the Jordan intensive Arabic or anything like that? Nobody, wow, that's cool, all right. Wait, where's everybody else going? I'm like Asia and Jordan are usually the other ones. Everybody going to Europe? Everybody's nodding at me, okay. Anybody going to South America? Okay, awesome. Where are you guys going? We're going to Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Oh, good. Okay, not as far south, but it's fine. <laughs> okay, and what do you guys like about this one? The contrast. contrast, shadows, yep. Once again, it's intriguing, right? Like, what are they doing? I, I don't know what this, it looks like water. Like, I'm not sure what it is. The steam, the natural expressions, right? Honest expressions. They're not looking at you. They're not making eye contact, but that's a pretty honest, he's into his work doing something, right? Awesome. Okay. Who knows the goals of BYU? Off the top of their head. Can anyone actually tell me? Because I could. So I wanted to talk about these a little bit because one of the great things about BYU is that you can go on a study abroad, right? And that we are in all over, like literally everywhere in the world, right? That's like so cool. Like I took a picture with my BYU sweatshirt in Bolivia, like in front of the biggest silver mine in the world. And everyone was like, what are you doing there? It's so cool to people. Um, and so 
we can have an influence wherever we go. And that's part of BYU's mission. So BYU's goals for us as students, for people who are studying here and going on these programs, they want us to be taught the truths of the gospel, which, I mean, like, we prayed in my biology class. So, like, I know that those things happen. Receive a board university education, okay? So this is, like, we don't – I'm a photography major, okay? Can I tell you how bad I suck at biology, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that class was rough, or, like, American Heritage. But we're in these classes because we're learning all about different things. And you guys are getting a different kind of education by going and spending – your summer semester or fall semester abroad yeah you guys are going to be learning in a totally different way you're learning a lot of things that you can't learn in a classroom and it really is going to impact you I hope it impacts you I hope if you, you come back and you just love what you did and you had the best time um and that's you know a very broad education um you should also receive instruction in your field so are any of you going with like specific programs with your major Okay, a couple of you. I know like some people like just go on a study abroad and it's not maybe in their major, but they go. Um, like props to everybody that's going. Um, but some people go specifically for their major and that's really cool and that's a special opportunity to be able to focus in your field. So take advantage of that. And then scholarly research. Okay, you're not sitting in a lab and you're not like counting tallies. I don't know what people do for research because photography majors don't do research in the same way. But you guys are gonna be doing research and endeavors in different ways, right? You're going abroad, you're learning about culture, you're learning about all these cool things, and you're being really involved. And so when you guys take pictures, I want you to remember to photograph the gospel abroad, okay? We talk about all these really cool things. Make sure to do your framing and your rule of thirds and get all these cool pictures and, and use your contrast and make sure to, you know, blur your background and all these really cool things, and you're gonna have such cool experiences. And I'm so excited to see your pictures when you get back because I get to look at all of them. <laughs> but remember to photograph the gospel, okay? So not just, I mean, take pictures of where you go to church. That's awesome. I don't know if anybody's going to a place that like you'll be in unconventional church buildings or whatever, but take pictures of the churches and the temples where you're visiting. But also make sure to take pictures of where the gospel shines, right? There's so many people that have gospel light, that have Christ light. There's so many things that testify of our Savior that you can photograph. And I think that's one of the awesome things about being a photographer <laughs> is like I get to go see people worship and I get to go see people um, be involved in something that is important to them. And you guys are going to be good in the world, but I also want you to make sure you see the good in the world and make sure to take pictures of it because that's something that even if you don't enter it into this competition, which is the main reason why we're doing this, You'll have those, and they'll be a treasure to you later. And then I just, I love the 13th article of faith, right? Because we're tr honest, we're true, we're chaste, we're benevolent, we're virtuous, and we believe in doing good to all men, right? And if there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things and we take pictures of them. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so just remember that we want to see those that aspect of your study abroad as well, okay? Okay, so some camera suggestions. How many of you are going with just a smartphone? Okay, do you guys have some good apps for taking pictures and all of that jazz? Okay, my suggestion, if you're going with just a smartphone, if you're not taking any other camera, there are apps that will actually let you control ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. So if you get one of those dinky little tripods, it's fine for your phone, right? I'm not gonna put this camera on one of those dinky little tripods because that's not gonna work. But get one of those like spindly ones that like stretch out in every direction. Look on the app store. I, I have some app suggestions, but I think they're all editing apps. Anyway, um, I know that there are apps, you might have to pay a couple bucks for them, but it's better than like buying a camera, right? Um, and they'll wor they're worth it. Um, just make sure you get a really good one that has good reviews, um, but they really do work. And I know even my film professor, he has filmed a whole video on, like a whole movie on his iPhone um, using one of these apps, and I can't remember what it's called, but um, just look around. And that's what I would recommend than just like your camera phone, because it does a lot of really good things, but it will work better if you can get an app that can help you. Anybody taking a GoPro? Awesome. I love GoPros, get the waterproof casing. Um, they are wide angle, I'm sure you know that, right? Um, but they do, they do awesome work, especially video work, so. 
Um, if you are looking for a good all-terrain waterproof, if I drop it, it's not gonna break camera, the GoPro is a good one. How many of you don't have cameras yet? Anybody? Okay, everybody else pretty much is sold on their camera, okay. Um, this is the camera that if you're serious and after this lecture you're like, dang it, I want like a really good camera and I wanna take really good pictures. This is the one I would recommend. I actually took it on my mission. It's this Canon G15. Um, it shoots in RAW, which is, okay, I didn't explain this and I should have. So JPEG is very compressed. All of your colors are compressed, your colors are compressed. Um, and RAW will help you open things up. So say if you get a camera like the G15 and shoot in RAW, when you get it home and you look, oh man, I have a bald sky, but I really like this picture, you can actually help adjust it in like Photoshop and it will bring back whites because it records more data. It doesn't compress things. So RAW, if you can shoot in RAW, that's the best way to shoot. Um, it has different names depending on what you shoot. So a Nikon is a, ne a NEF file. Um, the Canon is a... I think it's just a can. I don't shoot can. It. Um, but my, from this camera, the raw that came up are called DNG, um, which is a digital negative, which is the universal. You can open it in just about any program. Um, I would recommend that if you're thinking about getting a little bit more serious about your pictures. If not, this Canon Power Shot is a really good one as well. Um, it's kind of like an all terrain. <sighs> It's not wide angle like the GoPro, and it's not as good as video like the GoPro is, but it's a good little um, drop it and it shouldn't break, waterproof up to a certain depth kind of a camera, yeah? Mirrorless camera, Has it, does anybody have a mirrorless? What is that? It, so the DSLR, like this one that I have, has a mirror in it that it's what makes the sound, that it moves inside. So the mirrorless doesn't have it doesn't reflect back into your camera, and so there are no moving parts in it. Um, it's a good camera. If anybody's thinking of, like, they don't want to go totally pro with a DSLR, like a three-fourths chip or a full frame, the, this Fuji film is actually really good. Um, it's a little bit cheaper, and it works just as well. Um, suggestion for that. Um, it's a new thing. I've never actually, I've handled one once, and it, it takes really good pictures for what you're going to want. Um, it's not my preference to shoot on because I have this Nikon down here and that's what works for me because I, because I'm a photography major. <laughs> um, okay, DSLR 3 4 chip. I know some of you were nodding when you told me a DSLR. Who, I saw you have one, right? Okay, what do you, what are you guys using? Okay. Old 5100, okay. Um, those will be great. Those little ones are great. And then they come with the standard lenses. Um, you probably only go down to an F.5.6, probably. Yeah, or maybe a four. Yeah, um, they're good. Yeah, if you're looking for, if you'd like to invest in a lens, anybody that has a DSLR um, that they're taking with them, if you want to invest in a lens, I would suggest either an 85 millimeter, that's like F4, 85 millimeter, or a 50 millimeter. Um, yeah, if you can get an F4, that, I would suggest that. Um, anybody else on DSLR? Okay, what are you guys shooting on? Okay, awesome. And do you just have the kit lenses? I'm guessing. Okay, awesome. Do you know what it what it is? Is it a zoom lens? <laughs> That's okay. They're usually a 25 to 80, which is fine. Um, the static lenses, like I said, same with these guys. 85 would be a good one to look into if you want to get another lens. Yeah, and what are you shooting on? Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's great. These are great. Anybody with the Rebel, it works as well. Um, like I said, I prefer Nikon. It's just the way that I just didn't shoot Canon, and that's not. there's not anything wrong with Canon. Um, anybody taking a full frame? A Mark V or anything? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, that's fine. We won't talk about this then. Um, I wouldn't suggest that for a study abroad, unless you're like super serious, but they're way too expensive, so don't take one. Um, okay, who uses, does anybody use phone apps right now to edit their pictures like Visco? I'm seeing a couple of hands. Okay, what do you use? Visco? Okay. That's, yeah, what do you use? Snapseen? Okay. I tried to look up a couple of these before I put them up here for you guys. Um, I, okay, Lightroom, you guys, I just discovered this today and it's a dream. It's free from BYU. 
<laughs> okay. So when you get home, you can even email me and I will come help you with this because it will make your picture so much better. Um, you can download Lightroom and you can download Photoshop for free. Um, and if you're shooting in raw, it will help process your files and bring them up so that you can do some of that basic color correction we were talking about and some of that cropping, um, before you submit them to the project. And like I said, you guys all have my email. Most of you have my email now, right? <laughs> um, if not, <laughs> um, come talk to me after I can get you my email and we can talk about if you want to use Lightroom and are invested in that, we can talk about it. Um, Visco is the one that I have on my phone and I have Project Life. Um, I like Visco. It allows a lot of control of your pictures. Um, and this is more for like if you're shooting on your phone, right? You probably don't want to use your, your um, pictures that you take on your camera with a phone app. I would suggest Lightroom or, um, or Photoshop. Um, Lightroom, the good thing about Lightroom, when you guys bring your pictures home and you want to do some editing, Lightroom already has presets. So Photoshop, if you don't know how to use Photoshop, um, Lightroom already has presets. So it can help you adjust things. It's like an app you would use on your phone, but on your computer. It's, it's pretty intuitive and it's helpful and it's free, so why not? Um, and then this Project Life is another one I like to talk about. This has, okay, this is how most of you probably know this. It's a scrapbooking thing. Um, and people use it for their missions. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's, they have like these little cards that you're supposed to write on for my first transfer <laughs> and all these things. My whole scrapbook is done in them. They have a digital app version and it's great. This is more for, this project life is more for um, like you to create things. So what I will use it for is I'll take pictures on my phone and insert them right into templates. And then you can write a little ditty, right? Like something funny that someone said or where you are that day or whatever it is, you just type it into your phone. And it's a good way to almost kind of keep a journal. And then I saved them as 12 by 12 prints. And so at the end of whatever I'm doing, um, I just bring them into Shutterfly and put them directly into the book. I don't even have to like do any of the template messing or anything because they're already there from Project Life put them into the Shutterfly book and print off the Shutterfly book and they're gorgeous. So it's something I would suggest, especially like you might want to make a book of your study abroad on the pictures that you took. So that's when I su would suggest. Someone said they use Snapseed. What do you like about Snapseed? Um, I don't know, it's just like one of the first apps I found for everything that I got used to. Okay, one of the first ones you found? Yeah. Um, you guys, any of these are good. Um, this typorama and word swag allows you to add words onto your stuff and like cool fonts and quotes and jazz. Anyway, these are just kind of more for fun for you guys when you're out um, than like your official pictures when you get back, if you know what I mean. Okay, other tips. Shoot raw, I just explained that. Can someone explain it back to me? So quiet. Yes. Awesome, okay, so take some more space, but better for editing. I seriously would suggest it, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Raw images, um, I'm not sure. That's why I would look into an app, because I think there are apps that allow you to shoot in raw. Your normal phone camera will not, it will not allow you, it's just JPEG. Um, but I know that there are some apps that should allow you to shoot in raw. Um, okay, good. Any questions about raw versus JPEG or why I'm pushing raw so much? Yeah. Can you, like, can you convert raw into JPEG after Yeah, so the best thing to do, like Lightroom, right? So you're going to bring all your raw files in. You can edit them how you want, put your presets on them and stuff, and then you can export them as JPEGs. So it will compress them so they're not so big on your computer, but it gives you the chance to look at all the metadata that's in there and kind of change things around and have more data to work with, and then you can compress it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't send me raw files, <laughs> okay? When you guys are sending me emails, it's gonna take forever to upload on your computer and it's gonna be a nightmare. So send me a really high resolution, high resolution JPEG, okay? Um, yeah, same thing. F compress it down from your raw file and email it to me, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Um, invest in good SD cards. You guys, I've had SD cards fail before. So if you're taking a camera, just make sure to get some good ones. I know Costco has really good ones. Um, 
I wouldn't buy the cheapest one that you can probably find. Um, there are packs on Amazon that work really well. Um, I've just, I've had them fail before where they, the, um, this is a bad example. Oh, actually this one's good. Okay. These Lexar Platinum, these are great. Um, what will happen if you get the ch cheap one is these teeth will break right here. They'll bend and then they won't go into your computer and they won't go into your camera and you've lost whatever, whatever is on here. So, um, I like these Lexar Platinum ones. And then my other one that I like to use um, are the SanDisk Gold. Um, these I get at Costco and they're like come in a pack and they're 32 gigs. Um, I think they're the good ones, the Extreme Plus SanDisk ones. So just to let you guys know, if you're shooting Canon, you guys are gonna have different SD cards. Um, just maybe research what's better. Um, the, your small Canons won't, but if you have a DSLR Canon, usually the cards are bigger and different. So just look up those. I'm not exactly sure what's best. Um, as for SD card memory space, I would only get as big as a 32. You're gonna be tempted to get a 64 gig, just get 232. Um, what I have seen happen is that if you lose your card and it's the 64 and everything's on there, you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> if you, if it chips for whatever reason, if the teeth break, whatever, like you only have one card. So I would suggest getting two 32 gigs and then I would suggest backing them up on a thumb drive. It, is everybody taking a computer, like your own personal laptop? Okay, I'm seeing nodding. Um, buy, uh, don't bring a hard drive. Um, I know that they're small, like I have a Lacey disc, just bring thumb drives and then just keep them in a safe place in your suitcase or in your backpack and upload every so often so that you have them saved in two places. Don't erase them off your SD card, but keep them on a thumb drive as well because then you won't lose anything because I've seen viruses eat things. Um, I've seen, like I said, chips get ruined, but then they have them on a thumb drive so they're safe. They only miss like the last week or whatever. So just try and, and back things up, okay? Especially if you have your own computer, every night you can just plug it in, take whatever pictures, and then put them on a thumb drive. Um, like I talked about earlier, consider a light tripod. So anybody like those windy, spindly ones, grab one of those. I think they're, you can get them at Walmart. Um, you can get them at the bookstore, I think. Just maybe look at one of those. Yeah. An online storage? Yeah, if you have something like an iCloud, my brother uses a space monkey. Yeah. <laughs> the weirdest name but yeah I would suggest something like that as well yeah um any questions on tripod yeah um I would say no but you can get like an aluminum frame one that are really light to take with you um what I found when I was traveling is a lot of places don't allow you to carry on your tripod um in the states it's fine but like when I, as soon as I got down to Panama, they were like, you have to put it in your bag. So if you get a really, really lightweight aluminum one and pack it in your carry or in your, um, your checked bag, that's what I would suggest for a DSLR. Um, and something that like maybe fits in your backpack or like at least fits mostly in your backpack. Um, I have a heavy duty one and it's so heavy. <laughs> Don't do that. Just the spindly ones though, if your camera is too heavy, it will collapse and it can break your lens or whatever, or your camera or your mirror. So I would just, unless it's really sturdy, if you can put, so for DSLR, if the test is like, if you can press your hand on it and put some weight on it and it doesn't like completely fall out from under itself, then it'll hold your camera. So like just try pressing down on it and if it splits like that, then don't get it. Any other questions about tripods? Okay. Um, Okay, in crowded environments, a lot of you said you're going places with architecture, right? And a lot of you are going to Europe. Um, if you are in a really crowded place, sit yourself where you want your picture and just wait for a minute because crowds move usually. And so if you just like give yourself some patience, the crowds tend to at least clear a little bit. Um, just have patience. Just sit for a minute. Sometimes you don't have a minute to wait, and I totally get that. But if you do like stand there for a minute, let people kind of, they'll clear out. And especially if people see a camera, they'll kind of clear out a little bit. Um, and at least you can get less people than like a whole mass of people, okay? Um, that goes for as well following your groups. <laughs> um, I feel like when I was in Ukraine, a lot of my pictures have my friends in the foreground and I should have just like stayed behind a little bit and let them walk away for a minute and then caught up because um, I have all the back of their heads. So just patience. <laughs> Um, take multiple shots, um, try multiple angles, try multiple 
Um, I always try and take, most of your cameras will have like a rapid release fire button and it'll take three or four in a row. Um, try doing that. <laughs> um, it'll help out because you might get two or three of the same shot, but one of them, someone might be looking at you weird. I've had that before where I got one shot, but someone's like staring at me across the corner like this. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> you're getting photoshopped out. Um, so just take a couple shots and then you might not get so many weird faces. Um, and then just keep your camera handy. A lot of you, it sounds like have really small cameras. So if you have like a side bag or, um, you know, whatever I usually, so I have that Canon G shot. Um, and if, whenever I have that, it tucks right under my arm with my strap really nicely. So I know that it's there cause I can feel it and nobody has ever tried to bug me because like it's right against my body. Um, but it's nice to keep it handy cause then you can just kind of pull it up and, and take your shot, especially with little kids. If you're trying to get pictures of little kids or like want pictures of little kids on your program, they're so spontaneous and do the funniest things. So just like try and keep your camera handy. Okay. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Camera cleanliness. Get a filter on the front. Um, you have the DSLR, right? Okay, so anybody that has a, a camera that has a lens on it, you can buy what's called a UV filter for really cheap from Amazon. That will keep it from one, breaking your front glass, and two, you can take it off and just get um, a packet of the of like glasses cleaning wipes, um, just the really soft cloth, and just clean off your lens every once in a while and stick it back on. I think that's one of the best ones. Um, people fret a lot about rain and mud on their cameras. Don't. I have to tell you guys a funny story, okay? So this camera, it's actually like, I got it new for Christmas, right? And I guess you guys can't see it from up here. But... <laughs> It's banged up and dirty because I was taking pictures of miners in Bolivia and I fell in a hole. I like stepped backwards and like fell backwards and I had my camera in my hand. And so of course when you're a photographer, your hands up, like protect your camera, right? And I like totally fell in gracefully. Um, but it like totally got knocked around and I was so worried that it was gonna be beaten up. But these cameras, they're made for being tough, okay? So like a little bit of rain won't hurt it, a little bit of mud won't hurt it, a little bit of, I mean, don't like throw it places, but like, it, it's gonna be okay. Um, just if it rains, just um, especially with the flash, go ahead and just make sure everything's dry, all the crannies. Take the eyepiece out, take the pull the flash up, and just dry everything out, and you should be okay. Um, don't worry about cleaning your own mirror. If your mirror looks dirty before you go, go have someone at Allen's. Do you know where Allen's is? There's one on Center Street, and then there's one up in Orem. Go have them clean your sensor. If it seems like it's dirty for some reason, don't do it yourself. Go get it cleaned. Okay. Even I don't clean my own sensor. I don't trust myself. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Can you get the slide email? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Did you email me to RSVP? No. Okay. So, um, okay. T take your phone out, I guess. Um, I'll give you my email and then I'll, you guys can email me and say, hey, if you want the, if you want this presentation, you can email me and I'll send it out. It's kcphotocontest at gmail.com. And that's actually where you guys will be emailing your pictures when you come back in for September, okay? kcphotocontest at gmail.com. Yeah, and if you're interested in getting this slideshow, just email me and I can send it out to you, okay? I can actually share it with you on Google Drive because it's on my Google Drive. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, Oxford and then India. And then India, okay. Um, and you have the three-fourths chip. I would suggest, I would suggest a 50 millimeter or an 85 millimeter. Those are the two that I would, um, if you get anything that is like lower than a 35, it's gonna be really wide angle. And you're probably gonna wanna be taking pictures of people. Um, and it's not, it makes their noses look funny. <laughs> um, so 85 on a three fourths chip is your standard portrait lens. So that's a good, that's a good bet. Um, yeah. I saw another question. Yeah. Um, how do you know when to use your tripod? Yeah. How do you know when to use your tripod? What camera are you shooting on? Just a smartphone. Okay. If you are shooting in low light, um, so anything that you might want um, to leave like a shutter open for a little bit longer, um, 
So I would also suggest anything like a cathedral, anything that is inside. Um, and a lot of times cathedrals won't let you use a tripod. Um, so just ask, be careful. Um, and then things like shooting in at dusk, um, that's, those are situations I would use a tripod. Or if you're shooting something like nature where water is moving or um, wherever anything is moving that you want to be smooth. Um, those are situations I would use a tripod. Other than that, on your phone, you should be able to capture everything that you're you're wanting to do. Um, I would suggest more than more than anybody else with your phone, be pay particular attention to your lighting. Um, if you, I mean, everybody knows how to selfie light really well, right? If you lift your camera a little bit higher and tilt your face towards the light, if you're taking pictures of people, bring their nose towards the light source. It will create the best lighting on them. And try not to like. Try and get them to move their face so they don't have as many shadows. I think that's the best advice for a phone. And no matter what you're doing with that, try and always be really aware of your light because that is what plays big into, especially like your iPhone. Um, you can get really good pictures that way. So yeah, tripod, um, in, inside architecture or moving nature. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Um, if you do have questions that you don't want to ask in front of everybody or you have specific questions for me, I'm going to stay here for a minute. Um, but everybody else, thanks for coming and good luck um, with your study abroad. <laughs>